Welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am and we are so pleased that you have chosen and joined with us this morning. I understand your time is so valuable and we are so glad that you give that valuable time with us this morning. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And please wear your mask and social distance when you go outside. I know someone say it's just like flu and someone say it's not too much dangerous than you think. But please, we care you. And this is a time you have a little care others too. And now, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me, call to worship this morning. Behold God in the heavens, stretched out like a tent. Hear God's voice in the wind, whispering words of life and love. Witness God's glory in fire and flame, dancing colors of orange and red. Take refuge in God on the mountains, Silence, strong, immovable. Rest in the wisdom of God, hidden in the clouds above, 
and seas below. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless God's holy name. Please join with me time of confession, silent prayer, and assurance of God's pardon. Let us come to God in prayer. We are so sure of ourselves, O oh God, in the midst of our suffering. We wonder how it could happen to us, how easily we forget. Forget us, we pray. Forget us when we seek recognition. Rather than accepting the role of servant, teach us that suffering is not sent to punish, but that through our suffering we may better understand and heal the pain of others. <laughs> All of us who seek God and who have set your hope on Christ Jesus can believe the good news. We are forgiven and beloved children of God. Thanks be to God. Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you.
And now our reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us, and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Please join with me, responsibly reading from the Psalms. Today will be Psalm 99. The Lord is King. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is excelled. Over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God, worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of a cloud. They keep his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answer them. You were a forgiving God to them, but a avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. On September 27th, the Presbytery of Eastern Oklahoma ordained Minwoo Kim as a uh, minister of the word and sacrament. Uh, ordination service is a significant event for the minister and for the church and for the presbytery to have a new colleague to work with the churches and to work with uh, other ministers as well. Uh, because of that, uh, we <clears throat> posted the ordination service last Sunday morning rather than our normal service. I, I hope you had a chance to see it. Uh, if not, I would like to suggest that 
that uh, you go back and find it and at least look at the last few minutes of the service that, that talk about the, uh, the meaning of ordination and the ordination vows that uh, Minwoo Kim took. They are a reflection of the beliefs of the Presbyterian Church, from affirming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to uh, the Scriptures as God's Word for us through the promise to not only serve and minister, but to live our lives as examples for others. Those vows are extremely important. And again, if, if you have not seen uh, the ordination service, I hope you will take time to at least look at that part and think about what we as Presbyterians affirm for our ministers, our elders, and our deacons. Now, we don't expect that of all church members. We simply expect a, uh, an affirmation of faith in Jesus Christ, but for ministers, elders, and deacons, we expect those ordination vows to be lived out. I hope you'll take time to think about that. But you know, it did pose a problem. Well, as they say, good news and bad news. The good news is it gave me a Sunday off that I didn't have to prepare a sermon. Uh, the bad news is that we didn't talk about uh, the scripture last week. And it's one of the most uh, significant chapters in the book of Exodus, the story of the, the golden calf. And we need to understand that story before we read today's scripture passage. The people of Israel had, had left Egypt. They had come to the Red Sea and they were in danger of being decimated by the Egyptian chariots and soldiers. And, and God provided a way across the sea. And then as they were traveling in the wilderness, God provided water for them when they were hungry and manna for them and, and quail and, and water once again. God provided for their needs. And, and yet each and every time they complained and murmured and, and, and said to Moses, why didn't you just let us die in Egypt? Why did you bring us out here to die? God had shown his grace, his love, his care for his people over and over, and yet they, they continued to doubt. But finally, they made it to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and they camped at the foot of the mountain, and Moses went up on the mountain to talk with God. But you know, he was gone a long time. Uh, hours turned into days, days turned into weeks, weeks turned into to months, and, and, and they began to, to doubt once again. Where is Moses? Maybe he's dead. We, we don't know where he is. And, and we haven't heard from God in a long time. They began to be anxious. And I think that may speak to our situation today with, with the pandemic and the economics and the, the uncertainty and, and all sorts of ways these days. We, we feel anxious. Where is God? Where is our leader? You know, I, I think about this in, in maybe silly human terms, but if you've ever had a house dog, a dog that stayed in the house, you know that if you are late getting home from work, the dog is going to be anxious. What, what's happened to the master? The dog's going to be, and, and little kids can be the same way. I've come back from being on a, a conference or retreat somewhere and, and would anticipate my children would be glad to see me. And they really are, but in a way they pay me back for being gone. How dare me go off and leave them alone? Well, they weren't alone, their mother was there, but, but where was their dad? 
So the people of Israel became anxious. Moses was gone. God was absent. Everything is falling apart. And so they said to Aaron, Aaron, you be our leader. We don't know what happened to Moses. You be our leader. He's probably dead. You, you be our leader. And, and we want you to make gods for us. And Aaron, well, I mean, it's an honor to be the leader of the people. Aaron said, okay, and, and give me all your gold. So Aaron put all that gold together and, and made an image, made a golden calf. And the people said, here is our God. This is the one that brought us from Egypt. And Aaron built an altar in front of the calf and, and they worshiped. And then he said, we'll have a big party. And, and they forgot all about the Lord God, the one who had parted the Red Sea, who had provided water, who had provided bread, who had provided quail. The one who had saved them was, was, was forgotten. Now, there, there's a technical question here because the people said, make for us gods. And, and the word is Elohim, which is plural, gods, but oftentimes it's translated God, singular, the Lord God, one God. And, and perhaps the people were not wanting to totally leave the Lord God for other gods. Perhaps they simply wanted a, a, a representation of God, something they could see, because they, they still said, this is the God who brought us from Egypt, but they wanted something they could, they could hold on to, something they could look at, something they could bow down before. They wanted to create their own God. You know, Martin Luther is supposed to have said, famously said, Whatever you hold most dear, that is your God. When we become anxious and, and substitute other gods for the Lord God, we are worshiping idols, things that we make with our hands. And, and, and in these days, that could be anything. You know, we could be worshiping the vaccine, thinking somehow the vaccine is going to save us. Or we could think somehow the government will save us. Or something other than trusting in the Lord God. So the people went off turning away from the Lord who had cared for them all this time. And Moses came down from the mountain and he saw what was going on and, and um, Joshua with him said, well, this doesn't sound like worship and, and this doesn't sound like work. This sounds like a party. Moses realized what was happening. He got so mad, he threw down the tablets of the Ten Commandments and broke them all up. He was furious. God said to him, these people have got to leave. These people have got to go. I want you to lead the people out. I will keep my promise. I will keep my promise to send the people to the land that I have selected for them. I will not go back on my promise, but I am not going to go with you. And when the people heard this, they, they were contrite. They, they, they were so upset at what they had done that they took off all their ornaments. They, they in effect, fasted. Later on, it said often that people fasted with sackcloth and ashes. Doesn't say that here, but they took off all their ornaments so that they could visibly show that they were contrite. And yet the Lord still said to them, go, Moses, 
you lead them out. They can't stay here. And I will not go with them because if I go with them, this stubborn, sinful people, surely, surely they won't last a day. Go, go. It's a kind of a tough love that some people have had to display with their own children to say, if you cannot go by our rules, you must leave. You're on your own. Go. And that's what God did. People turned away from him. And he did not turn away from them. But he did say, go, go. With that background, listen to the next part of this story. As Moses talks with God about his problem having to lead the people out. We're reading from Exodus 33, beginning with verse 12. So Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you've also said that I have found favor in your sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know and find favor in your sight. Uh, consider, too, that this nation is your people. So God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So Moses came back again and said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? So in this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. So the Lord said, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, but he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see my face and live. The Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Here ends our reading from the book of Exodus today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love some of these stories have uh, God interacts with people, with Moses, with Abraham. And, and in this particular story, Moses is faced with a dilemma. He is the leader of the people. God has said, you shall lead the people out from Mount Sinai, but I will not go with you. God said, I'll send a, I'll send a messenger or an angel. Remember at the Red Sea, there was the angel and there was the cloud by day and the fire by night. 
I think that same angel would be the leader of the people of Israel. So as God sent his angel, Moses would lead the people. But Moses doesn't want to go with God left behind. And so there is a kind of a subtle bargaining going on in the scripture we just read. Moses says to God, you have said, I find favor with, with, with you, and, and you have called me by name, and you have said that I'm to lead the people out, but you haven't told me who is going to go with me. Now, that's just a flat untruth, because God has said, I'm not going, and I will send an angel. But I, I get the feeling Moses is hoping God forgot that. And, and maybe God will say, okay, I will go with you. So Moses is trying to get him to commit to going with them. And God has not said that. So Moses tries one more trick that he's used before. He said, remember, this is your people. Now, recall before when God and the people were at odds, they, they played a game of, of uh, pronouns. God said, this is your people, and Moses said, no, these are your people. Here God is, is being reminded, God, these are your people. You need to come with us. You need to look after us. And God says, well, I'll send my presence with you, and, and I will give you rest. But the presence is not the same as saying, I will go with you. So Moses is not quite satisfied yet, and, and, and he tries again. Show me your glory. Show me your glory, Lord. Your presence, your power, your strength. Show me. And God said, I'll show you my goodness, but no one can see me face to face. No one. And so there is this funny story. God says, okay, uh, come up here on the mountain, stand right here on the rock, and, and I will reveal myself to you. But here's how I'm going to do it. You stand there, and I will put my hand across the face of the cave in front of you to block it out. And then as I go by, I'll take my hand away and you can see my backside, but you'll never get to see my face. Now you think about that. What we think about these people that far back as being primitive, simple people, but the people who put this together into what we call the Bible, they, they knew God was not a person. They knew God did not have hands. Uh, we, but we still talk that way, don't we? we? We sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. It's got you and me, sister, in his hands. But we don't really believe that, that somehow we are in God's hands we're saying we are secure in the presence of God. And Moses knew that as well. If you take this literally, you'd have to think of, if Moses was, say, six feet tall, well, then God's hand would have to be six feet tall. That would make God about, I don't know, 75 feet tall. Can you imagine him stomping around the mountain, 75 feet tall? That's, that's not what this is about. This is about Moses being so close to God that he could argue with him and bargain with him to try to get a promise out of him that he would be with the people. He said, I will go with you, but I am not going to go with you the way you want me to. I will show myself to you, but you will not see my face. So what do you think it means to say that we can see God's backside, 
but not God's face. The face reflects the personality. The backside is, well, kind of vulgar, right? I mean, when you think about it, I think this passage is saying that we can see God and we can know God, but we can never know God in a way that we can control Him, that we can own Him, that we can get Him to do what we want Him to do. If you, you think about this in terms of what's important to us. What if I said to you, I trust you completely. I'll take care of you. And, and you said back, well, that's great. Would you give me your bank account numbers and your password? And, and by the way, maybe your credit cards while you're at it. And I'm going, mm, maybe not, maybe not. Isn't that what's going on here? God is promising to take care of us, but we have to trust him, rely upon him, because we can never be in a position to control God. All religions try to create a God that they can control, that will do what they want. And the Lord God says, I love you, I care about you, I, I will protect you. I will bring the Israelites to the promised land. But, but, you cannot control me. They knew that. They knew that. But again and again, the people of Israel forgot it because they wanted to do things their own way. And God called the prophets out to, to preach to the people. You're just doing these things to go through the motion. You're, you're obeying the Sabbath and, and you're making offerings only to go out and then cheat and kill. And, and, and I will not allow it. In the New Testament, the prophets, uh, the disciples spoke to Jesus. Show us the Father. We, we want to see God. We want to know God. A and Jesus said to the disciples, have you been with me so long that you don't understand? The Father and I are one. If you know me, if you've seen me, you know God. We know Jesus. We know God the Father. We know God's will for us revealed in Scripture through the Holy Spirit. And yet, we can't control God. We can't reduce God to what we want. We simply have to trust God. We have to rely as the Israelites did that God will get us through the wilderness to the promised land. In these days of pandemic and, and uh, political stress and unrest, economic stress, we have to trust God that God will get us to the promised land. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, there are times that we want guarantees. We want promises that, that we can see and know rather than trust in you. We pray, Lord, in our anxieties, in our weaknesses, in our lack of faith, that nevertheless, you will move us along undergird us with your presence that we may know you until that time that we do indeed see you face to face. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
We are all God's people, from Korea to Sri Lanka to Malawi to Tulsa, Oklahoma. God's people who have responded to the call to worship, serve, and go out in service to one another. We are glad that you joined us in worship this day. We pray that God's Spirit will undergird and sustain and protect you day by day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, abide with each one of us this day and every day. Amen. Thank you.